Shalom to Rabbi Moshe Tergen, uh, teacher, educator here in the Gush Etzion, uh, Har Etzion Yeshiva. Hi. Hi. So what can you tell us about uh, the atmosphere here this morning? Look, uh, it's a real empty feeling. You wake up to a world that's dramatically different. This is an individual who literally shaped orthodoxy across the globe for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, both on a personal level, having taught them, as well as being the, uh, the icon of certain thoughts, ideas, and values that literally people across the globe deeply subscribe to. And when a figurehead like that uh, departs, you wake up to a different world, to a different reality. Um, it's still, we're still processing, it's still difficult. Uh, unfortunately, he was ill for a while, so uh, we weren't able to fully appreciate uh, his presence and his teaching. So um, it's also um, the passing of a generation. There's someone who was a still underwent the Holocaust and studied from the great European teachers and helped fashion yeshivas across the world, but particularly this yeshiva in the classic European Lithuanian model. And it's really his legacy that this yeshiva represents. And what we're seeing here in the Beit Midrash is the students continuing the learning, continuing the path. Well, it's, a, it's an awkward time between the actual death and the burial. Um, the eulogies will begin tomorrow and um, there'll be ample time to eulogize a man of this stature and men of this magnitude. And there'll be a week-long eulogy and, and I'm sure events across the globe. But um, before the actual eulogies begin, we're trying on the one hand to keep the daily routine active because that's something that he believed very, very deeply in. He believed in the primacy of Torah and that Torah must be studied not despite the difficulties of the circumstances, but because of the circumstances. I remember during the Lebanon War, waking up early in the morning to, to pray in the early early 80s and he would give a shear and then he'd be helicoptered off to Lebanon to speak to the troops and he was absolutely insistent that the learning not be disrupted. So in part in deference to what he stood for, we're trying to keep the learning and obviously we've suggested that the boys take certain extra learning as well as learn some of the enormous amount of Torah that he produced. I mean it's just simply the, the, the volumes of Torah that he produced and we're giving out and distributing some of that Torah that they should study it in this time between the death and the burial. That's hard not to notice here in uh, the yeshiva. Many students from abroad, lots of English and Hebrew together, and that was also part of the Rev's agenda, his vision. He dramatically revolutionized Torah study across the world. And the yeshiva has been a major, major force in the Israeli scene for the last 50 some odd years. But certainly Rav Ara Lichtenstein's arrival and incorporation to this yeshiva jettisoned the yeshiva into an international arena. And uh, he, he became along with all the other teachers, but he really became the icon and the figurehead and the outlet and conduit for this yeshiva to spread its Torah and its ideas, and ideas which obviously transcend the yeshiva, but there are thousands, and like I said, hundreds of thousands of people across the world that look to him as their spokesman and as the, the, um, the, the vanguard person that developed the ideas that shaped their lives. So you were familiar with uh, Rav Lichtenstein, blessed memory. What can you tell us about his unique and uh, great character? Well, he, he was unique in three aspects. Namely, his erudition was unparalleled. You're looking at someone who literally, one of the greatest Tamedi Chachamim, one of the greatest Torah scholars of our generation, has now departed. But that was coupled with a seamless and very agile ability to integrate classic Torah study and deep, passionate, as well as highly successful. This is a world-class Tamar Chacham with an openness and an integration in the world around them, being able to fuse those values and show how they can enrich and deepen Torah passion. As many people know, he has a doctorate in literature. That's obviously a secondary part. He spent most of his time studying Torah and taught us that Torah. But we were all taught that confidence to approach a very dangerous and frightening world sometimes with openness and confidence that it could be integrated. What a lot of people don't know about him is what he really was, for those who knew him as an inner circle, who had his chus to know him for upwards of 30 years, as great a scholar as he was, and as pious as he was, and as committed as he was to religion, his midos and his kindness were unparalleled. If he hadn't been such a great Torah scholar, he would have been the nicest person, the nicest Jew you ever met in your life. Genteel, humble, caring, considerate, his human interaction, and that combination of erudition and piety coupled with just kindness, compassion, moral righteousness, willpower. He taught us all to impose our willpower. He never let us, uh, this is a man who in his prime would hardly sleep at night, would be so dedicated to Torah study. 
used to end his lectures way, way, well, well after the lunch began because he wanted to teach us not to be subject to the whims or the hormones in our stomachs. And this is someone who literally taught every one of his students a composite, holistic way to view life and to lead life through Torah. You know, when we say uh, openness, some people, you know, tend to think that we're talking about less strict in uh, Judaism, less halachic, and that's not what we're talking about here. Not in any sense. Uh, if you were looking for a kula, if you were looking for halachic leniency, this is the last person you wanted to ask. Deep-rooted, unflinching commitment to the immutability of halacha, to the irreversibility of our masara, coupled with classic, unparalleled Torah scholarship, but an openness to to, to admire, to acknowledge the broad range of ideas in our world, and to see how those ideas could help enrich a Torah-centered lifestyle, but certainly not uh, um, flexibility or lackadaisical attitude towards halachic performance. So we're here in a yeshiva, it's lost its leader. What's next? How do you continue? Well, there are two next stages. The next stage, obviously, is the immediate sense, and we're going to all mourn the loss. And as I said before, there'll be literally mourning and weeping and wailing in cities across, in Jewish communities across the world. And people will be connecting in different ways through social media, through listening to interviews like this and other forms of connecting. And uh, the person in that passing, you, you, you want to first absorb the shock and suffer the absence. You don't want to be too to co coordinated or, or, or um, uh, uh, clinical in your response. And also we want to remind ourselves of all the values he taught us. In a larger sense, he had the courage to launch his own succession. And uh, that's not something that the leaders of that celebrity level are often able to accomplish. And thank God our leadership is in place. And um, that's the greatest, one of the greatest legacies, his accomplishments, having built such an important institution and having positioned the leadership to continue his work and continue his values. Rabbi Moshe Terrigan, thank you very much. Thank you.